At Baptist Health South Florida, it's our mission to care for you when you're injured or sick and help you stay healthy and fit. Welcome to the Baptist Health Talk podcast, where our respected experts bring you timely, practical health and wellness information to improve your family's quality of life. How is the coronavirus pandemic affecting our mental health? Dr. Jonathan Fialco and his guest psychiatrist, Dr. Rachel Rohide, outline simple, practical coping strategies in this episode of Baptist Health Talk. Hello, Baptist Health Talk podcast listeners. This is your host, Dr. Jonathan Fialco, and I'd like to welcome you to another special edition of our show as we try to keep you informed during this coronavirus pandemic. Today, we'll be talking about the coronavirus, but more importantly, some of its effects on our mental health. Um, This can be from children who are now at home uh, away from school and hearing things in the background uh, that parents may be talking about, elderly people who might be particularly concerned regarding their high risk should they get sick, and of course, everyone in between, including um, our family members and, and our Themselves. Everyone's being affected by this in some way. What's going to happen with school? Am I going to lose my job? Are there enough tests? How do I know if I'm sick? These are all real questions. We will be uh, answering some of these questions in a follow-up podcast, um, but right now, I think we really are going to be dealing with the real mental health significance and aspects of this unprecedented time. Um, so today, we're going to be joined by Dr. Rachel Rohide, a Baptist health psychiatrist who specializes in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of mental, addictive, and emotional disorders. And we'd like to welcome you to the podcast, Dr. Rahidi. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, these are very uncharted waters we're navigating, Dr. Rahidi. Um, you know, you have great experience in treating people who have uh, various, um, uh, we'll say, mental health issues from depression to anxiety to various other components. Um, but I think it's fair to say that in this, this, this hyperacute uh, time, um, you're probably already seeing a higher uh, acuity or maybe a higher volume. So what are you currently seeing that might be related to this coronavirus pandemic? And what do you expect to see uh, over the next couple of um, weeks to months? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, absolutely seeing a lot more um, anxiety, um, stress, um, exacerbation of depression. Um, you know, we don't really have, we, we're inundated right now with so much information. Um, and, you know, a lot of things are coming up for patients, uh, new diagnoses and old diagnoses, chronic diagnoses that are now um, worsening. I think it's. I think you know. It's even one thing we say that um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. People go on the internet or they hear rumors, and that's pretty bad. Uh, but lack of information is almost just as powerfully uh, negative. Um, not hearing anything. So I think people should find the proper resources to get their information, whether it's a legitimate news channel or, uh, you know, other means, maybe within Baptist Health, we're having a lot of communications as well. Um, but how would you or how would you recommend people respond if they hear something that just might be emotionally ready? You know, I heard of a five-year-old who wind up having a problem or let's maybe say a 30-year-old. How, what should people start thinking about when they start hearing pieces of information to say, wait a minute, let me put this in context. What, what can I do to not let this piece of information really lead to a full-blown, you know, anxiety or panic reaction. Or panic attack, right. You know, that's, that's the thing. Um, and so we're inundated with so much information. And sometimes we leave the news channels on now that we're, you know, a lot of us have to work from home. Um, we've got our cell phones. We've got tablets and computers. And I mean, we're just inundated with information. So I, I want people to kind of stop, you know, take a breath. And really only say, okay, do I really need 12 hours of information? Do I need this constant um, stimulation? Um, you know, say that you're only going to do, you know, 15 minutes of, of, of listening to the news. Uh, only get your news from a reputable source, um, whether it's, you know, one of the news channels or you know, something that, uh, like podcasts or, um, information from medical, uh, big medical, um, facilities. Um, I, I think we need to really calm down the 12 hour marathons of, of information. 
I, I love that point, and I'd like to uh, elaborate briefly before we move on to some other ones. Um, and this is actually true even before coronavirus, yeah. just with our political environment, where yeah. this constant news stream, people will have the news, and whether it's one TV channel with a particular political bent on in the background, but it's actually been shown to have significant mental health effects. And I think, oh my goodness, um, yeah. yeah Tur- turn that off. You know, there's, it's going to be there for you to find out the information. Don't don't let those things run. And one important thing I think we could also say is certainly turn it off a good hour or two before you go to bed. You don't want to be watching or exposed to this hyper stimulatory conversation and then expect to have a good night's sleep. It wouldn't you say oh, there's a component absolutely. to that as well? Absolutely. Yeah. My biggest thing as a psychiatrist is sleep. And I try to impart sleep hygiene on all my patients. Um, if we don't get a good night's sleep, it's, you know, we're, we're going to have much more stress and anxiety because we're not going to be able to process and heal through our night. And so absolutely turn the TV off, turn news off, turn the phones off, turn everything off a couple of hours before you go to sleep and wind down. Absolutely. So let's so let's let's transition that component into let's say uh, four topics and then of course more um, um, as we have the conversation um, because I think when people have a, a situation that's very scary and we see this when hurricanes are pending um, they don't have control so they look to control things they can't control so for example the run on toilet paper even though there was no short supply of toilet paper and has nothing to do with the coronavirus people just feel they they got to control things by 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 protecting themselves. Um, Things people can't control at home. So now people may be working from home. They might be sequestered at home. You don't have situations where they're going to be around their kids all the time. They're going to be around spouses, like we said, family members. Let's take four components and let's take them one by one. And I'll put them as sleep, exercise, diet, and then let's use the term mindfulness, which might be a situation where people can take 20, 30 minutes of their day and just mm-hmm. kind of relax their mind. So as far as sleep's concerned, you mentioned a great term, sleep hygiene. Can you give some advice and some recommendations um, towards what that would entail? Oh, absolutely. So sleep hygiene is really a series of behaviors. And so what we want to do is we want bedtime to be sanctuary. We want our bedroom, our bed to be sanctuary. And so, you know, bed should really only be used for sleep and sex. Those two things, that's it. So we have this thing of being on our phones in bed and watching TV in bed, simulating our minds in bed, and then we get a poor night's sleep and then we wonder why. So if, if, it's kind of like sleep training a child. So if you, we have to sleep train our bodies. So if you simulate your brain and at the same time you're lying down in your PJs to go to sleep, how, how can you sleep? You're, you're, right. You know, your brain is saying, oh, it's party time. We're supposed to watch this movie and we're supposed to listen to music and we're supposed to talk to Aunt Sally or whoever, you know. Um, so bed is really sanctuary. Everything, anything with a, with a screen on it needs to be done outside of bed, outside of the right. bedroom. Um, you want a nice dark room, nice and cold, comfortable bed. Um, and if you can't sleep, don't stay in bed for an hour tossing and turning, get out of bed until you're sleepy again and then come back to bed. You, it, It's all training. And, and arguably, get out of bed, pick up a magazine, keep a dim light, don't put the TV yeah. on, don't start looking at your screens. Because I think that's the other component. And those points are absolutely outstanding and um, rep shown to be beneficial. And, and, and as people who've listened to the podcast know, sleep is, a, to me, a very um, um, underappreciated component of yeah. our healthy lifestyle. So light therapy is important as well, which is, like you said, bright lights turn off the brain towards being ready for sleep. You know, we evolved from the sun starts going down, it's twilight, we get a little sleepy, the sun goes down, we go to sleep, we wake up when the sun comes up. Now we have TV screens and iPads and we have lights in our home. So dim the lights an hour before bedtime, right? Light a candle maybe. Um, you know, don't, 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 um, don't watch the TV, certainly close. These are therapies that if people, again, especially if you're at home, start planning these, try to go to sleep the same time every night. And there really are physical and mental health benefits from doing so. So I, I, I think that's incredible incredibly great advice. Let's Especially talk about a little bit. During this time, I think it's really important for people to keep that schedule because now, you know, people are working from home, kids are home from school and we're like, oh, it's vacation time. Well, at some point we're going back to our regular lives. And so we've got to keep regular sleep and waking hours. 
So, so that, that's going back to the time and you're going to be home and these are the type of tips. Let's talk about exercise a little bit. Clearly, there's benefits of exercising even before a coronavirus uh, pandemic. But again, when people are in this very stressful situations now, can't control a lot of things that are happening to them in our society, we can control our ability to get up and perform some level of exercise, which could be, again, just putting the TV on and walking in place. It can be going outside for a walk, which we'll get to, but it's still considered a relatively safe thing to do, keeping your distance from other people in this you know, sequestered environment of social distancing. Um, so can you speak to the, the, the mental health benefits of, of doing something physically active you know, every day or, or, or five to six days a week? Absolutely. We definitely see the benefit of some kind of exercise 20, 30 minutes, a couple times a week. Absolutely. It will help decrease those stress levels and that in turn helps decrease anxiety and it helps mitigate the symptoms of depression. And it's really hard sometimes to exercise. You know, we, we, we've got busy lives and we're doing, uh, you know, now we're working from home. So, you know, we're cleaning or we're taking care of the kids or, um, you know, but it's very important, again, regular hours of waking and sleeping, get a schedule, do 15, 20, 30 minutes of some kind of exercise at home, whatever it is that you need to do. But, but absolutely, we need to keep exercise at the, the forefront of our brain because we kind of forget about it. And as we've been talking to some of the patients again with this transition or people, not just patients, employees, friends, you have time now. If people are working from home, they don't have to travel to work. There's now time on people's schedules, which arguably if someone sits around and just lets their ma- their mind ruminate or just will follow social media, you will be misusing that time to make things worse. Take that 20, 30 minutes or more and do something physically active with that time where the excuse you used to have, well, I don't have time has now gone away. You do have time. In fact, maybe right, one of the issues is that's great. Diet, again, regular eating habits. Uh, we don't need to get into specific foods of being healthy or not healthy. Anything that you can recommend regarding, again, our mental health, our ability to avoid uh, depression and anxiety that that might be dietary? Absolutely. As we know with like, you know, the uh, regular sleep schedules and exercise, uh, we know that diet also plays a big role in mental health. And so, you know, now that we're, we're home, you know, don't grab for the chips so often or the sodas or things like this, you know, keep them maybe for um, a cheat day, uh, you know, the weekend, something like this, but do your best to keep up with, you know, drinking water, being hydrated, um, trying not to eat fried food, nothing that, you know, you open up a bag and, and start munching, um, just trying to keep as healthy as we can. Um, uh, before, uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit about physical complaints and somatic complaints to give people that advice. Before we get to that one, let's talk about, you know, the last of the four bullet points that I kind of mentioned, uh, which is mindfulness, whether it be meditation or yoga, just, just quiet times for the mind. I, I will tell you, I actually started personally practicing this about a month ago, getting up a little early in the morning and I won't bore everyone with what I'm doing, but I actually do find a little dedicated time, like we said, away from the TV, away from the social media, uh, quiet time, listening to the birds and outside what do you what what do you would you recommend in that component as well that people can start doing if they haven't been doing before and maybe building up to a higher level i think that we have some great sites on our um tablets and phones that we can find you can look it up on youtube Uh, we have some great apps meditation apps and just taking just starting with five minutes a day um, and then building up from there and 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 they're they're great some great apps out there um, some great um, YouTube videos as well. You can just look up meditation and you don't have to spend an hour meditating. Um, you know, you could do five minutes and just kind of learn how to do it and, and see if it works for you. I think it's yeah, really sitting, mm-hmm. deep breathing, getting rid of the external stimuli. Yep. And it's actually something that people can do together as well, even though Absolutely. you want to have your own personal space, but you know, you can have a, a, a couple and even one or two of their kids and they make it a family thing. Okay, for the next 20 minutes, no talking. Everyone just sits and closes their eyes and breathes and it actually becomes a little bit of a family bonding and another stress relief type of component as well. So uh, I think that would be absolutely. something that people should consider. Not, you know, not that we're home, um, you know, with the kids and with, you know, our spouse and our family. This is a great time to really build the family and, and, and build these relationships. Um, you know, you, you can look online in, in, in Pinterest and all these sort of things and get, you know, kind of an, 
um, one of these like exercise things and do like a, a mini challenge and, and, and have all the family members join in for exercise and then do something for meditation and then have everyone join. I, I think these are gr- this is a great opportunity to really build on our family communication and bonding. Yeah. And I think you had mentioned earlier, the, the idea is to start building it as a routine. You now can sit there and almost like create a, a schedule for yourself for the Absolutely. day or for your family, make it the routine. And in addition to the benefits of each particular activity, it gives us a sense of control. At least I know what my day is going to look like tomorrow. At least I know, uh, yeah. you know, some aspect of this I can handle as everything else you know, around us starts becoming a little uh, more and more uncertain. Absolutely. Um, any put- any particular recommendations, and this might be fair, you know, given your, your discipline, for children, anything parents should look out for regarding their kids or things other than what we've mentioned that they should be particularly um, doing with kids or paying attention to kids? Sure. I think that, again, this is a great opportunity for parents to bond with children. I think reassuring children that they're safe, um, letting them talk about what's bothering them, about what they've heard on TV, let them ask questions, and just be open and honest with your children. If you don't know something, maybe look it up together. Um, I think this is a great time to share coping skills because I think the children will be able to take this to other spheres of their life once all of this, you know, we get back to our normal daily routine. Um, Showing, you know, learning coping skills with your kids. So these breathing exercises, this mindfulness, um, and this will help for them to take that into their daily life when they get back to school. Um, And I think limiting exposure, not only to us as adults, but limiting exposure of news to children. I, you know, we give kids these um, apparatuses where they, you know, they have information 24 hours a day. I think, you know, learning what your children are watching, being really involved in their lives. What are you watching? Who are you watching with? Um, I I think all of this will build and strengthen our family relationship. That's that's well said as well. Um, Going back to now the somatic complaints, what are the kind of physical complaints that people may have or other uh, kind of things people may identify, which then would say, hey, wait a minute, this is getting a little out of hand. Either I could recognize it and take care of it myself, or I should then seek seek further help. What would be the kind of uh, signs or, or, or symptoms that would um, escalate, make things es- make people escalate things? So you know, in psychiatry, and you know, especially well in primary care. I mean, I I always feel like our, our primary care physicians are our front line, um, and so when patients come in with um, physical complaints that they maybe have not had before, or now that are exacerbated, and they can be different for for everyone. Um, And we know that any stressor, any extreme stressor can bring out physical symptoms for people because our our brains are just, you know, we can't separate our brain into little compartments. Everything's kind of, um, you know, hooked up together. So, you know, weakness, um, tremors, um, abnormal movements, issues with, um, you know, stomach pains, um, um, Things, you know, uh, increased pain issues. So we definitely know that when people are extremely stressed, when a stressor hits and perhaps the person does not have the best coping skills or perhaps doesn't know how to process all of this new stress, it can come out in physical symptoms. And, um, you know, I I always want to tell and press into um, my patients that these aren't, you know, this doesn't mean that you're crazy. This doesn't mean that you're, you know, something's wrong with you. It's just, we, we need to have education. We need to have coping skills and we need to learn how to manage stress because once it gets out of our hands, you know, that's when we can kind of get into trouble with it. I, I agree. And like the symptoms you met again, we did a, we did a segment on palpitations and, and, um, and other somatic compl- uh, symptoms that might be a sign of high adrenaline, cortisol, stress, all those hormones. So yeah. people should recognize I'm feeling it. Oh, this is why. Let me relax. Let me do those breathing exercises. Let me see if I can control it. And then again, if it becomes obviously something serious, we want them to either contact a primary care doctor 
call a care and demand type of uh, telehealth Absolutely. service. Try to avoid the emergency room unless it's really something serious because that's you know they're they're getting overwhelmed obviously with this this situation as well. So I think that that's good advice. And a very nebulous question. It might change day by day. What resources would be available to people? They say, listen, I'm not doing well. I I need help. Where and and again, it's not your job, so to speak, individually. But what kind of things? Where do you think people should be looking to? Um, should they need help? Um, I think definitely um, it's, it's sources like Care on Demand. Um, a lot of um, offices are now turning to an online platform. So if it's not Care on Demand, you can find other things um, online. Um, and and I think you know trying to minimize exposure as much as possible. So um, if we can call our doctor's offices first to see what right. they're doing instead of just showing up, um, right. maybe calling an urgent care, calling an ER to see, well, what online platforms are you guys offering? Or is there someone that I can just speak with? Um, I, I think we need to keep um, those resources. Um, yeah. I think that you know we don't want people to overuse the the high acuity resources, which are already exactly. being overwhelmed with other issues. Um, and I think, as you said, many medical offices, my practice as well, we're developing these televisits where through phones or through computers we can actually do a pretty good medical visit with people without them having to come and leave their house and be exposed in waiting rooms to everyone else. So I think that's going to become the new normal um, um, very quickly if it hasn't already. So people should realize that. And I also want to mention we mentioned Care and Demand. This is a downloadable app um, through Baptist Health. Medical uh, through Baptist Health South Florida, where people can have access to uh, medical giver, uh, medical caregivers, and um, 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 through their um, through their phones and their um, uh, devices. Absolutely, I also want to press that on care and demand. You know, people can also find um, therapists, and so we kind of forget about that that mark in um, that area on care and demand. And so, you know, if, if people are having panic attacks or if they're having, you know, high anxiety or stress, I mean, th there are people out there to help um, talk you through things. And I think talking to a therapist is not talked about enough because of the stigma. But if you can do it from your phone, you know, from your computer, from your, from your own home, um, I think that would open up a lot of, of people to the idea, to getting that. <sighs> Right. Well, you know, we can keep going on. This is a very broad topic. We could probably spend a few days running seminars on this, but I think, uh, you know, the benefit of your expertise is to give people some guidance, some sense of control, an opportunity if you're going to be home and you have time to start creating those routines. Make yourself even healthier if you have that, if, if you look at it that way. Um, we could recap with some of the other advice. Don't use social media as your source of information. Use proper sleep hygiene, and this is something that I think you gave great tips, but people can go online and see what that means as well. Uh, exercise, diet, those 20 to 30 minutes of mindfulness, do it as a family. It really has physiological and mental health benefits. These are these are great points. Is there anything, um, I, anything you'd like to add um, before we wrap up uh, the podcast? Uh, what I also would like to say is that, you know, we want to try to not just avoid bad food and eating healthy, but we also want to try to minimize our alcohol use while we're at home. Um, sure. I, I think that, that, you know, staying um, as healthy and clean is also, you know, trying to stay away from, you know, drinking as much while we're um, absolutely. Um, you know, um, the whole concept of social distancing, again, we could maybe have another podcast on this. People should realize you kill, you can take a walk. You can do yard work. You can play in your yard. You clean out your closet, read a good book, listen to music, cook a nice meal, have a family game night. I mean, video chats. We are social animals. It doesn't mean we should be sequestered from the rest of the world. We can video chat with friends and family. You know, check in on an elderly neighbor by calling and seeing if they're okay. They're alone. There are lots of things we can do that still remain safe, that are considered social distancing. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Heidi, for the, for the insight suggestions. We could, all, we could all take a deep breath right now. <laughs> and uh, thank you, listeners. We hope we provided some tips that you and your family can implement um, during this time. As always, send us any questions or suggestions. Go to Baptist Health Talk at baptisthealth.net and send in the emails. We'll try to address any um, uh, thoughts or topic requests for the future. Stay, stay safe out there, and please use common sense. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news.
and be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. This podcast is brought to you by Baptist Health South Florida, healthcare that cares.